Dinkins, missionary with OMF International, working in Thailand, and this is my 40th year with that organization. Over 20 years ago, I listened to a lecture on four key areas that seem to trip up Christians. The presenter used a very simple graphic covering sin, bondages, demonic, and wounds. Over the years, a workshop was created to help missionaries and nationals to deal with these four areas. At first, it was called prayer counseling, and later it was changed to healing prayer. These workshops have been presented all over Thailand, both in English and in Thai. With this particular presentation, I would like to summarize the key points of this teaching. The four key areas, as I said, start with sin, bondage, demonic, and wounds. I'm only going to treat four key areas for teaching purposes, but as you know, people are very complicated. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And we should realize that there are mental and biological factors that contribute to various dysfunctions that people encounter. Thus, I readily admit that there's a need for doctors, for psychologists, psychiatrists, and counselors, experts. So it is important if you are counseling someone to know at what point you should make a referral to a certain expert. What I'll be sharing today is designed for pastors and lay leaders who end up with a need to, to have basic principles of counseling under their belt. We start at the most basic level by talking about sin, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time expanding on this topic, mainly because we have an innate, God-given understanding of sin, and we also hear a lot of sermons and teaching on this particular topic. Sin has been described as failing to meet God's holy standard, all of sin has fallen short, the glory of God, of missing the mark, of exceeding the boundaries that God has placed down for us in the scriptures. And most basic would be a desire on the part of people to just kind of raise their fists fist in rebellion. The solution of sin and all four of these topics that we're going to speak about today is obviously the cross. And for sin, which is something that we may do purposely to hurt another person, maybe unconsciously hurting someone else, and even hurting ourselves. In each case, uh, the issue needs to be forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God in Christ has forgiven us. So basically, we need to learn to preach the gospel to ourselves on a daily basis, not just wait around till Sundays. Sin, which is not dealt with and is allowed to continue on and on, becomes a besetting sin. It becomes a negative type habit in people's lives. One way to describe it would be what I encountered when I was in central Thailand riding my motorcycle. You'd find that in the rainy season, Cars and motorcycles would go down a certain muddy road and it would make a rut. Now the first person could pass quite easily, but as more and more cars passed or motorcycles, then it became an ingrained rut, a deep rut. And I personally have gotten caught in those ruts and been flipped over on my motorcycle. In the old days, those ruts would have been made by carts like this pulled by probably a water buffalo. Another object lesson that we could use would be a boomerang. As you know, the Aboriginal people of Australia are very adept with this tool. They can throw it even like 100 yards and it will come back to them. I think all of us deal with different sins that we try to cast away from us and it 
seems like they just come back and kind of hit us in the back of the head. So the way to know of a bondage would be situations where you are trying to get rid of a certain sin, but it just seems to come back over and over. Uh, a real issue with addictive type practices is we often are in denial and people will say, oh, I don't have a problem with alcohol, I don't have a problem with drugs, or any number of addictive type practices. If you have a besetting sin, if you allow a certain sin to go on and on, it can, can become entrenched. And it's entrenched in a probably a slow manner, meaning it starts as a toehold, it then becomes a foothold, and finally, as the scriptures refer to it as a stronghold, something which can bind us and can chain us. And there are numerous bondages, even seemingly good things like food, like work, trying to please others. There's obviously lots of bondages in relation to culture and tradition, different lusts, gossip, lying, stealing, and many more. We can also look at addictive activities with this acrostic of BEEPS, B-E-E-P-S. First of all, behaviors. Addictive behaviors could be something like anorexia, bulimia, gluttony, becoming a workaholic, behaviors connected to our cell phone, behaviors as we're on social media, people who are addicted to gaming, those can be various behaviors that become addictive. Events, some people live for exciting events. They wanna to go to a concert, they wanna go see what's happening at a bar. Experiences also, and people, particularly adolescent people, they take risky, chances oftentimes they want to have a, an adrenaline rush and that's why people get involved with gambling obviously sex pornography even driving fast cars and motorcycles thrill seekings of various kinds people can be in that category of addiction as well seeking the approval of other people seeking people's applause seeking fame and the last one is probably the one that people are most aware of is substance abuse, alcohol, and drugs. On the internet, I looked up what were the 10 most common addictions. They are alcohol, tobacco, drugs, sex, gambling, shopping of all things, food, video gaming, the internet, and addiction to work. Now, as a believer, you could say that behind each one of them, was a basic idea that God is not sufficient. God is not able to actually meet my needs, so I'm going to look for an artificial way to have my needs met. And as we all know, the deep-seated needs of people in people's hearts, uh, people don't like a vacuum, they wanna have that need met. And when they don't feel God can meet that need, then obviously they're going to look to other means to get that need met. God needs to be big enough to overshadow our addictions. God has the power to pull you out of the pit of addictive habits. And the way to do that is to replace them with spiritual disciplines with positive godly habits. Books like The Bondage Breaker go into this process in real detail. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. This topic is often passed over in the West, the whole topic of the demonic. But it is a key topic in the country of Thailand. Satan came to maim, kill, and destroy, and he has a field day doing this in Thailand, but also in much more subtle ways in the West. Satan has his finger in all of the three other areas. He does tempt man to sin, enslaves them into bondages, 
and he especially enjoys inhabiting people's woundedness. A key passage in spiritual warfare is Ephesians 6, the armor of God. It starts by talking about the helmet. And that helmet is to protect the mind, to protect the thoughts, because Satan is often shooting fiery darts to make us believe his lies. And so we need to have a firm confidence, assurance in our salvation. Also talks about the breastplate of righteousness, and that is obviously the positional righteousness that we have as we trust, rely on the Lord Jesus, but also practical righteousness. The girdle of truth, or the belt of truth, and that is a foundation for all the other tools. They kind of hang on the truth of God's word, the truth about the Lord Jesus. And then feet shod in preparation for the gospel of Christ. And that is a willingness and um, an ability to give your testimony, to be ready, to be used by God. The other two weapons in this arsenal would be the shield of faith, and it is specially designed to extinguish the fiery darts of that evil one. Faith, trust, reliance upon God and his faithfulness. And then the other weapon would be the sword of the spirit, which is both offensive and defensive. All of it is put on by prayer. And so one of our best weapons as we stand and we fight would be the whole topic of prayer. A key verse is James 4, 7, submit therefore to God and resist the devil. Now, if it is a sin that's in the area of lust or sexual sin, then Paul tells us that we should flee. But when it's the issue of spiritual warfare, the scripture is clear that we are to stand, that we are to fight, we are to resist. Now, in our healing prayer workshops, this topic of woundedness is the one that we spend more, more time on than any of the others. Wounds have a different dynamic than the other three because wounds often occur when we have been hurt by another person, and often that person might be someone very close to us. It also may happen when we are quite young, when we are very moldable, and the influence of a trauma when we are young can actually embed lies into our thinking, and as a result, we're going to have to have the truth of God to dispel those various lies. Those lies, particularly when they happen at a very young age, are hard to ferret out. Sometimes it's very easy, in a sense, to deal with sin as you recognize it, confess it, renounce it, and get God's forgiveness. But wounding is almost like an onion where you have various layers, and that trauma may be at a very deep level in a person's life. The way I think of a wound would be a physical wound that I received when I was about seven years old. Now that's 60 years ago. My grandmother told me not to play in the garbage pile, but there was a broken bottle there and I was acting like a pirate. And as I swung the bottle around, I actually hit my wrist and I cut it right down to the bone. I did get a healing from that, but 60 years later, I can still see the scar. So the scar is an evidence of a trauma that I received many, many years ago. What's interesting is after this healed 60 years ago, the emotion of me telling that story is still raw. I can still remember running into the house and thinking that I was going to die. So a woundedness or a wound in a person's life creates a scar, and that could be a psychological scar, a spiritual scar, and we need to allow God to come in and to actually speak into that scar with his truth. Life 
It may give you many traumatic moments. It's like being stabbed emotionally. Some people, it may be in the area of psychologically, could be physically, mentally, or spiritually. And those wounds leave what are called A and B type woundings. A means the absence of good things and B means bad things. I think it's very easy to think of a wound in connection with Bs, with bad things, with traumas, with crisis. But realize if a particularly a young person has an absence of the good things that they should normally receive, the warmth of a parent, uh, people that would hug them, that would touch them in a proper way, if they had an absence of just the basics that a young person should have to, to develop properly, then that can also bring a woundedness. Another aspect of this is the difference between lie-based wounds and sin-based type activities that people are involved with. In other words, when you sin, your conscience should tell you that you have violated God's law, that you have gone past the boundaries God set, you have not reached his standards, you have missed the mark. And we should often pray that the Holy Spirit would remind us and convict us of sin. And then dealing with sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And so dealing with sin is a little more straightforward than when you have an embedded lie. And that is why we need to have truth applied to these residual lies that may be deep inside of our psyche, deep inside of our souls. So our greatest need is to have truth. And we all know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God is truth. And John chapter 8 says, if, if the Son shall set you free, you'll be free indeed. In fact, it says that as the word is truth, it will set you free. I'd like to summarize all four of these topics with what I call a spiritual life graph. It's a way to trace the rather kind of traumatic downs that we have and then the very nice highs that we are given in our life story. The best person I know to go back to in these four areas would be the life of Jacob. And you'll remember as he started out as a young adolescent, he was quite the deceiver. His name actually means supplanter, the one who grabs the heel. And you'll remember that he deceived his brother Esau to get the birthright and then to get the blessing, he deceived his father Isaac. And that caused a real trauma, a real hurt in Jacob's life because he had to flee from his family. Esau was going to kill him. Then the next scene that we see in Jacob's life is where the deceiver becomes a deceived. And it's interesting that Jacob becomes enslaved, as it were, to Laban, because Laban was much more adept, adept at deceiving than Jacob was. And for 20 years, in order to get Rachel and then, Le and then Leah, you'll remember he had to work very hard, and he, he said that his wages were changed 10 different occasions. And so what you sow, then you're going to reap, and that's what happened in Jacob's life. He was in bondage, as it were, to Laban. The next would have been woundedness in Jacob's life. Jacob was at Peniel, and he wrestled with an angel all night. But just before that, you remember, he got word that Esau was coming with a, a, a large crowd, a big group, soldiers, and Jacob was pushed back to that trauma and that hurt when he deceived his brother. And he was terrified. He was very frightened. And that was the woundedness that was kind of surfacing in the life of Jacob. An angel of the Lord wrestled with him all that night. And you remember, as dawn 
was starting, the name of Jacob the deceiver was changed to Israel, which means prince with God, or many people feel the one who wrestled with God and gained the victory. So this was a real high point as God met Jacob in his woundedness. The very last aspect would be when Jacob took the family household idols and he placed them under a tree and he was making a clear break with the demonic. And what is interesting is the results that came from that choice, that decision to do away with those household gods which he had carried with him for years and years. So the Bible has given us very key resources to deal with each of these issues. Sin, bondage, demonic, and wounded. And my prayer is that we will take full advantage of his spiritual resources.